Uh, dear professors, colleagues, students, uh, we are glad to welcome you at our third issue of Web Library of Neuropsychiatry, managed by International Center for Education and Research in Neuropsychiatry, Samara State Medical University. And last week of May 2021 is nominated as Schizophrenia Awareness Week, and also 24th. Uh, May 2021 is the World Schizophrenia Day, and we're happy to support uh, this um, direction and to spread the word uh, on behalf of our center about schizophrenia. And today we have a prominent speaker, Professor Paul Cumming uh, from the University of Bern, uh, Switzerland. And uh, Professor Paul Kami is the expert uh, in neuroimaging, and the lecture will be devoted to molecular imaging of schizophrenia. The floor is yours, Professor Paul Kami. Thank you for that introduction. I have chosen for today's uh, talk to focus on molecular imaging of schizophrenia, as opposed to the more general topic of neuroimaging in, uh, in the broader sense, which often includes magnetic resonance imaging. I believe that that topic is something for another day. So today I will instead uh, talk about some typical findings obtained by positron emission tomography and its allied technology of SPECT, revealing the molecular basis of schizophrenia. Now, of course, I don't need to explain much about the uh, uh, clinical diagnosis of schizophrenia to this audience. Um, but let us say that this uh, has been among us for centuries, if not millennia, as far back as, as we can say, here depicted in a uh, famous illustration of the um, Bedlam Hospital, as it came to be known, St. Mary Bethlehem Hospital, for formerly in London, since the Middle Ages, a place for concentrating the um, uh, people who would now be called mentally ill um, for whatever causes, organic or psychological. Now, um, this place was notorious and has become a term of, uh, in the English language, bedlam as being a place of general disarray. And as you can see, it was until fairly recently, uh, until the late, I think, 19th century, um, it was possible for um, people to pay a, a, a ticket to visit Saint, uh, to visit bedlam. Here we see two elegant ladies who are viewing the site as kind of a form of entertainment which reflects how uh, attitudes have changed. Um, and indeed that is something in the matter of a product of the uh, Re Renaissance. Here a famous painting showing uh, Dr. Pinnell <coughs> who famously um, unleashed, unloosed the, uh, the chains that were used to bind um, patients in a long-term psychiatric hospital in Paris. And he was viewed and is to this day viewed as the kind of initiator of the modern humane uh, perspective on the treatment of the insane. Um, now, uh, as they were then called. Um, and of course, uh, from that optimistic point of departure around 1820, um, we uh, unfortunately had some setbacks in the course of uh, uh, attitudes towards the treatment of specifically schizophrenia, most notoriously in the um, inappropriate and really criminal use of uh, the uh, leucotomy um, that was popular in the mid 20th century, especially in the United States. Now, uh, short, shortly after that photograph was taken in the 1950s, there was the advent of modern psychopharmacology for schizophrenia with the discovery, I think, of uh, chlor chlorpromazine or one of the very early antipsychotic medications, which has led to a vast diversification of drugs that have some degree of efficacy, at least against the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. And this pharmacology, their pharmacology, is presumed to give some hint about the underlying pathology of schizophrenia. Um, there are, there's a great plethora of possible variants of the original antipsychotic drugs. So I say that they come in many colors, but more specifically, they come in many chemical compositions. And this uh, famous diagram, I think from Phil, the late Phil Seaman from Toronto, um, shows the observation that supported the so-called dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia, 
Um, the observation being that on the x-axis, the um, clinical potency for controlling uh, schizophrenia from the very potent uh, um, uh, uh, uterophenones to um, less potent compounds such as chlorpromazine, which require gram doses per day, there is uh, an, a clear association um, with the in vitro findings of the affinity of those very same medications for the dopamine receptor as labeled with haloperidol. And so this, of course, does not prove causality, but it shows that the more potent the, um, uh, the compound, the we're treating schizophrenia and the lower dose consequently retired, required, um, the more effectively it interacts and tightly it binds to dopamine receptors, suggesting that dopamine receptor affinity is the determinant of clinical efficacy. However, I want to be cautious about this and refer to the term syllogism, which is a logical term for a form of reasoning where a conclusion is drawn uh, from a, <coughs> about a missing middle a connection between two things, such that all dogs are animals, all animals are quadrupeds, therefore all dogs have four legs, except those that have lost one in a tragic accident. So somehow this kind of uh, logical thinking or fallacy prevails in the context of schizophrenia, like so. Antipsychotic medicines relieve the positive schizophrenia symptoms, that's clear, at least in many cases. Second, antipsychotic medications block dopamine receptors. Therefore, schizophrenic, schizophrenia patients have too much dopamine or too much activation of receptors. It doesn't actually follow. It could be that the problem lies elsewhere and it just so happens that dopamine blocking alleviates the symptoms. That's uh, something that I think we all have to bear in mind. Be that as it may, uh, a new era of brain research began with the advent of molecular imaging by positron emission tomography, which we call PET for short. And in this procedure, a pharmaceutical can be tagged, incorporating into its chemical structure a radionuclide that emits radiation in the form of a positron, which is an antimatter electron. And therefore, you can follow where the drug goes in the body by monitoring the emissions from the drug. But first, to do this, you have to make the positron-emitting radionuclide. And this requires an instrument called the cyclotron, which consists of two uh, nesting magnets surrounding a, a vacuum space, around which particles are accelerated by alternating current to very high energy, in this case, a proton, um, which when bombarded against a stable isotope of oxygen, oxygen-18, yields um, um, excuse me, um, the, by neutron absorption, by a chemical a nuclear reaction ultimately yields fluorine 18, which is a very unstable radionuclide that behaves just like fluorine. So this is actual transmutation of matter from oxygen to fluorine, uh, yielding a, a, a highly radioactive product that decays with a half-life of two hours. So if you make it in the morning in the cyclotron, it's mostly gone by the end of the day. Um, this is the inner workings of, the, uh, of a medical cyclotron, which measures about a meter and a half in diameter. And here you see the various targets where the uh, oxygen could be placed to be bombarded from a beam extracted from the cyclotron. Um, it's shielded. You don't want to be in the same room as a cyclotron when it's operating because it's fiercely radioactive. <clears throat> and the basic principle is that fluorine 18 um, decays to oxygen 18, uh, returning back to the, from what it came from, with the release of an E plus, that is an antimatter electron or a positron electron. Now, if that occurs in the medium of the brain, it doesn't have to travel very far before it encounters an el electron somewhere in the water or any element uh, uh, of the brain matter. And opposite charges attract, of course, they interact because there is no uh, force to keep them apart and they annihilate, releasing all the energy that was bound up in that electron-positron pair, expressed as E equals mc squared, the Einstein formula, as two photons. It looks like a burst of light here, but more correctly, it's two photons going in opposite directions. One gamma photon, high energy gamma, going this way, and the other going that way, um, spread at 180 degrees. 
and they contain all the energy that was uh, bound up in the matter of the uh, positron electron pair. So they're very energetic. They can go through, um, these gamma rays can go through a centimeter of lead. Um, but they can be stopped with detectors. And here we see, I think, the first uh, PET scanner built in the 60s, which had a ring of about 10 detectors uh, that were placed like a crown over the head and wired together in such a way that the simultaneous emission of two photons, gamma photons, from an annihilation event somewhere in the head, barreling out away from each other at the speed of light, they encounter uh, on one side of the scanner uh, a detector and another side of the scanner another detector as shown here. And that event, if it happens in the same moment, counts as a decay. And by cal counting millions of those events, you can build a picture showing the distribution of radioactivity in the brain of the living person sitting here awake, more or less comfortable in the scanner. Modern scanners are much cleaner. They hide all the wires and furthermore, they cost millions of euros and well, uh, they contain thousands of detectors. The more detectors you have, the better detail you can see in the image. So now from <clears throat> the modern uh, medical technology, I go back 200 years to the time of Pinel uh, and uh, um, in 1817 with the publication of uh, the famous essay on the shaking palsy, now named after its author, Parkinson's disease, who uh, classically described it as involuntary tremulous motion with lessened muscular power in parts not in action, therefore at rest, and even when supported with the propensity to bend the trunk forward and to walk from, proceed from walking to a running pace destination, <clears throat> the senses and intellects being uninjured. Except for that latter comment, we now understand that Parkinson's brings with it cognitive changes. Except for that latter comment, this is a perfect clinical description of Parkinson's disease. So why am I talking about Parkinson's disease in the lecture on schizophrenia? Well, because of the central connection with dopamine. Um, here, a clinical picture of paper showing the um, progression of micrographia, which is the lessening amplitude of handwriting and motion in general in a, a Chinese um, speaker who proceeded from a normal condition to uh, a more compressed form of writing as her Parkinson's disease uh, rigidity uh, advanced. And in concert with that, her brain was undergoing a progressive loss of its ne essential neurotransmitter dopamine as was first shown in the 19, very early 1960s, uh, originally based on autopsy observations here of the mesencephalon on the right-hand side from a normal individual showing the highly pigmented dopamine neurons of the um, uh, mesencephalon. And here a patient who died with very advanced Parkinson's having suffering a nearly complete loss of brain dopamine. And the association with um, but schizophrenia and Parkinson's on its opposite ends in some sense of a spectrum of too much dopamine versus too little dopamine was established early on by Professor Arvid Carlson of Sweden, who discovered dopamine in the brain in 1958, I think. Someone had to discover it, and he went on to connect it with the control of movement and hypothetically with the uh, chemical pathology of schizophrenia. Here in his uh, famous 1960 experiment, he treated rabbits with the uh, toxic alkaloid recipine, depleting dopamine in the brain and rendering them essentially immobile. But upon giving them uh, the precursor of dopamine, levo not levodopa, it didn't exist then, but the racemic mixture, DL-dopa, the bunnies <clears throat> perked up immediately and started hopping around like normal, thus restoring them, curing in effect, their chemically induced Parkinson's disease. And at the opposite end of that spectrum, too much dopamine could also be a bad thing. Now, uh, Arvid Carlson, um, who won the, the Nobel, shared the Nobel Prize in the year 2000 for his discovery of dopamine, um, um, presented at his Nobel lecture this old figure, which I love because it shows in very schematic terms what a dopamine sy synapse consists of a presynaptic structure containing uh, uh, mitochondria with monoamine oxidase in it, containing synaptic granules that store the dopamine and release it, 
and uptake sites that take it back up into the neuron and enzymes for transsynthesizing dopamine from its amino acid precursor. The whole point being that the dopamine is supposed to act postsynaptically at receptors expressed on the target cells in the nervous system. And um, Professor uh, Carlson, although we only met it once, I considered my mentor, and in fact, this is my shoulder. So I was taller than him, but in other respects, not uh, to be compared. Now, um, um, with the discovery of, fluoro do of dopamine, dopa and the synthesis of dopamine from its precursor amino acid, um, actually a Canadian scientist uh, in the um, late 70s um, proposed the idea of labeling dopa dihydroxyphenyl ethylamine Phenyl, um, uh, yeah, not ethylamine. It's the amino acid. Excuse me. Um, now, the um, this is the uh, amino acid containing the uh, uh, carboxyl group and the amine. Now modified by the addition into the structure of fluorine eighteen, where there was normally just an ordinary uh, phenolic proton, and that makes it radioactive, but doesn't otherwise change its. Uh, chemical property. So it behaves just like, almost like natural levodopa, and uh, it is radioactive due to the fluorine 18. So they generate the fluorine 18 in the cyclotron in the morning, incorporate it into the chemical molecule of dopa to make fluoridopa, and then use that as a PET tracer for positron emission tomography. And like natural dopa, fluoridopa crosses the blood-brain barrier after intravenous injection. And when it meets a dopamine fiber, it is trapped inside that fiber because it's chemically converted by decarboxylation by the enzyme dopa decarboxylase that makes the corresponding um, amine, which is fluorodopamine, still radioactive and now trapped inside the vesicles of the dopamine fibers. So that is the principle. By introducing a radioactive tracer, fluorodopa, into this pathway, we can label the, the living neurons by virtue of their ability to take up the tracer, decarboxylate it, and trap it inside granules or vesicles. And here, this scratchy old photograph is one of the first uh, um, depictions of um, some of the first depictions of PET scans with fluoridopa in, that were obtained when um, I was a graduate student at uh, the University of British Columbia. Using fluoridopa, we see that a normal individual has high uptake in the dopamine-rich caud caudate and putamen, whereas people with Parkinson's disease and certain other syndromes have a very substantial loss of that dopamine capacity, especially in the putamen and a relative sparing in the caudate. And that matches perfectly with autopsy results. So much for Parkinson's disease. There's no doubt that you can look, actually, and this is an example of a radiological uh, use of fluoridopa PET because you could, if you didn't know already, diagnose Parkinson's disease pretty clearly by just looking at the scan. Now, the other side of the coin, a functional excess of dopamine in patients with psychosis was hypothesized since the 1960s as first introduced by um, Arvid Carlson. And um, 30 years ago or so in Montreal, the first test of this was conducted using fluoridopa in a small series of patients with schizophrenia uh, in the uh, PET and psychiatry group, uh, which then operating at the Montreal Neurological Institute. And the, net, the, fi the results are summarized here where we show the average fluoridopa uptake in a series of 13 normal subjects with a high uptake in the caudate and putamen. This is the average of 13 scans. So each brain is kind of stacked upon each other and normalized. And uh, the main finding is that um, the patients with schizophrenia, of which there were only five, show a highly significant increase in dopamine trapping. There were only five because it was very difficult to recruit five patients with schizophrenia who were not medicated because medication would interfere with the results. Um, and uh, that was the initial finding showing that there was as expected, an increase in some sense in the dopamine level in the brain. Um, they also, we also scanned uh, a few patients with uh, complex partial seizures with uh, interictal psychosis, 
an equal number of five cases. And you notice that they had an increase, but it was only on the right side, which happened to be the side where the uh, epilepsy was uh, in the dominant hemisphere. More about that later. So, but in a sense, increased fluoridopa signal is not, while it's present in schizophrenia, is not uniquely characteristic of schizophrenia. There are other conditions where that can happen. Um, because of that intriguing result long ago, many people tried replications and Professor Oliver Howes in London and Shadish Kapoor now in, uh, in Melbourne um, compiled all the available studies up to about uh, five or 10 years ago um, and in a, in a sense combined them into one single study of many subjects. This is called a meta-analysis. And the results of their meta-analysis are shown nicely here. In historical sequence, the first such study, the Montreal study from 1994, showed a very big increase in fluoridopa in a small sample of schizophrenia patients compared to controls. And then there were various uh, rep replications, mostly, but not always, showing a, an increase, um, continuing to the, uh, 19, 2010, and this actually is an old paper now, so there would be several more replications since then. And this tra trapezoid here represents the, uh, the, effect, the composite effect of all of the subjects who represent nearly 200 patients and 200 controls. Not something you could do uh, um, very easily at one particular site, but by combining all of these different uh, data sets together, it was possible to show that there was indeed an overall effect that was highly significant, P less than 0 0.001, which is one, once in a thousand. And that convinces me. One single PET study like here, Reith et al, with five subjects is interesting, but not convincing. But if it is, holds true for several hundred patients, it emerges as being a real biological result. However, statistics is very harsh. Um, in this figure, we see normal distributions, which would describe most pet results in a population. In the lower figure, this is what we would consider a good or diagnostic separation where, for example, this might be schizophrenia, fluoridopa results, and this might be healthy controls. And if we were so lucky that we could scan somebody and just say from looking at it that they belonged with 95% certainty to one category, that would be diagnostic. However, for the case of fluoridopa PET, although the averages are different, the distributions overlap very significantly. So we can say that the meta-analysis shows that there's something wrong with dopamine in schizophrenia as a population, but there are many individuals with schizophrenia who have normal dopamine results. I think this is a very important concept. So now we go proceed to a, another representative study using a, a similar compound, carbon-11 DOPA, which is another pet tracer. And um, they, they had a, a, what is typical for a pet a, a study group, 12 patients and 10 healthy volunteers. And you can see once again, as, uh, as generally found, that uh, Patel et al. Um, <clears throat> and Karolinska were able to show uh, that schizophrenia patients had uh, an increase in fluoridopa trapping or carbon-11 dopa trapping. Interestingly, they found an asymmetry. Um, if you recall, we also saw an asymmetry in the very first study, but in partial complex seizures, uh, complex partial seizure patients, suggesting that asymmetry of the uh, basal ganglia abnormality can be a characteristic of schizophrenia or psychosis from whatever cause. Not everyone sees it, but it happens often enough that I think it's a general uh, phenomenon that there may be inherently an asymmetry of the dopamine system in schizophrenia. And this harkens back to 1960s vintage um, uh, thinking by Crow uh, in, in the 70s and, and uh, in Edmonton, my hometown in Canada, uh, um, there was a psychiatrist who saw the link between epilepsy and schizophrenia who also claimed um, it was Flor, Pierre Floor Henry who showed that uh, there was some association between temporal lobe epilepsy and dopamine asymmetry, linking perhaps the uh, syndromes of epilepsy and schizophrenia. Now, suddenly I take a, a leap away from uh, the dopamine system to um, me metabolic PET studies with 
fluorodeoxyglucose or FDG, which is a glucose analog that is widely used the world over for PET imaging, usually diagnostics, because it's highly taken up in tumors, for example, in these uh, lymphoma, axial lymphoma lesions and uh, throughout the, um, the groin area and uh, in the lymphatic system in general here. Now, this uh, uh, patient was scanned with FTG at baseline and then was treated by chemotherapy and uh, enjoyed a, near, a complete uh, cure, basically, of, of the disease characterized by an absence of uh, fluorid FTG avid lesions. But you see, the doctors weren't interested in his brain. They all were only interested in these uh, lymphoma sites uh, in the periphery. And you can see just cut off that there was very high FTG uptake in the brain. And indeed, uh, it's, uh, the brain is hungry for glucose and for its analog FTG, and is a very um, amenable to study by FTG PET, if that's what you're interested in. It's not good for detecting le tumor lesions in the brain because these tumor lesions would hardly show up against the high background of, uh, of uh, the PET signal, physiological PET signal in the brain, but they show up very clearly against the cool background of normal muscle and uh, tissues. So the brain has very high FTG uh, uptake. Normal brain glucose um, burns glucose faster even than uh, lymphoma lesions. And so it's been very useful for neuropsychiatry research to do focus, ignore the rest of the body that is interest to nuclear medicine doctors and focus only on the head. And this is a case study, or not a case study, a report in three patients with um, a particular variety of schizophrenia, catatonic schizophrenia characterized by Im immobility and uh, rigidity and uh, various other uh, aspects. And in the lower figure, we see their fluoridopa scans, which I guess showed the usual kind of tendency towards an increase. But um, uniquely or characteristically in this subgroup of patients, they only had three because catatonia schizophren catatonic schizophrenia is rare these days. They all agreed in showing low metabolism, specifically in the temporal lobe on both sides, maybe more on one side than the other, it's hard to say. But uh, this was worth noticing because uh, it, it's not typical of schizophrenia in general, but only of catatonic schizophrenia. I don't know why that should be, but it shows that there's potential for uh, physiological subtypes within categories of schizophrenia. Um, in ordinary, that is to say, um, schizophrenia, the, the results are less clear, but um, here we see the results of a study um, um, from, it's an old study, but a very good one, I think, where um, they compared um, patients, fluor fluorodeoxyglucose, that is glucose metabolism, in patients who had um, predominantly negative symptoms versus predominantly positive symptoms. Uh, another, a, a very key uh, 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 axis for uh, uh, defining different subcategories of the symptoms of schizophrenia. And what they found was very striking that the um, negative symptom patients who were characterized by social withdrawal and uh, uh, behavioral changes, uh, cognitive deficits and so on, had, um, were hypometabolic as shown by the blue. This is a statistical index comparing uh, the two groups of brains, if you will, um, positive and negative symptom brains measured with FTG PET. And interestingly, the hypometabolism was widespread over the cortex from the frontal, temporal, and occipital lobes on the right side. And once again, we, we see ourselves uh, drawn to some idea that the uh, brain asymmetry is contributing to the syndrome of schizophrenia. So the, the dopamine excess may be sometimes or often on the right-hand side, dominant hemisphere. And the hypometabolism specifically associated with negative symptoms is uh, on the right-hand side. But you see the areas where the um, converse was true, where there was excess uh, activity were more um, symmetrically distributed left and right. So FTG PET gives a hint that there's some kind of lateralization of brain function in relation to the symptomatology of schizophrenia. Um, along kind of the same lines, the Oliver Howes group in London, uh, who are really the leaders in this kind of work right now, um, took fluoridopa scans, returning back to the dopamine pathway, in groups of young people who were uh, prodromal for schizophrenia, who had the uh, prodromal syndrome, um, 
which is highly predictive of conversion to schizophrenia in the near future, but did not yet meet this, the criteria. And they followed these patients after scanning them, and some of them converted. I forget, it was maybe half of them and became psychotic. Um, and then after the fact, post after the fact, um, they compared the fluoridopa scans um, of those who became ill and those who remained relatively healthy. And they found that the ones destined to become psychotic already had uh, an excess of um, dopamine in the basal ganglia, symmetrically in this case, um, that seemed to predict or foreshadow that they would become ill. And this is, of course, a very interesting concept because it suggests that the dopamine defect precedes the actual illness and maybe a risk factor in a sense. And it also implies that uh, if one were bold, it might justify trials of antipsychotic medications in people before they become actually full-blown psychotic. So, so much for the dopamine system. It remains an active topic of research in molecular imaging and schizophrenia, but dopamine is not the only neurotransmitter and the broad spectrum of tools for psychopharmacology research has been applied to um, different aspects of the uh, brain of patients with schizophrenia using a whole gamut, a whole range of different radiopharmaceuticals in addition to dopamine targeting radiopharmaceuticals. And one example of that is the uh, muscarinic M1 receptor, which is a metabotropic, metabotropic acetylcholine receptor or uh, a class of, of uh, four or five different uh, receptors that are uh, roughly similar, uh, notably the M1 type uh, receptors, which is the target of this uh, notorious uh, plant, the um, um, Jimson weed, as it's called popularly, popularly um, in, um, in uh, English that contains atropine, and, uh, other uh, atropine-like alkaloids that have medical use, but are also risky because they're abuse and some people believe it or not actually will eat these plants um, for shall we say recreational or adventure effects at the risk of suffering a very severe uh, uh, acute uh, drug-induced uh, psychosis um, that has some uh, at least overlap with, um, with uh, schizophrenia. Um, now the group of uh, 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 Therese van Amelsfort uh, in, in uh, Maastricht um, did uh, a study using a ligand for M1 receptors in patients with schizophrenia. So they had no control group. It was all schizophrenia patients, but they measured the uh, M1 muscarinic receptors in brain using SPECT, not PET, but it was, it's the same principle, a radioactive molecule that targets a specific receptor, in this case, muscarinic receptors. And then they correlated the individual cognitive um, state of those patients with their individual muscarinic receptor binding. And they found various uh, uh, correlations, which um, here we see that they had about 25 subjects, which is nice because you really need large data sets to discern these relationships because of the high individual variability. And within the population, there was a high correlation such that um, the more impaired cognitive performance for example, in the delayed recognition task and other, other tasks, um, the lower the binding of the muscarinic receptor in hippocampus. And conversely, within those patients, those who had relatively um, um, uh, preserved uh, uh, um, uh, function had the higher levels. So it suggests that there's something to do with the individual degree of involvement of the muscarinic receptor uh, system and clinical manifestations in the negative symptom domain of uh, that is more like cognition uh, that is kind of representative of the negative symptoms. So um, whereas dopamine results tend to correlate with the positive symptoms, as I probably should have mentioned, we see here that in this axis um, of uh, muscarinic receptors, there's a kind of an inverse relationship. So um, this is relatively little studied. Um, the, um, a uh, paper by um, Therese Amersfoort um, was published a few years ago and it follows upon a small body of work that fairly consistently shows that there's something amiss with the muscarinic receptor but in schizophrenia. But 
on the scale of things, there are 100 dopamine papers for each muscarinic paper, in fact, and in molecular imaging. And I think that reflects a kind of a bias that we, we have, that it's easier to do dopamine studies, it's easier to get funding to do dopamine studies, but we may be missing things. We are missing things by not paying enough attention to other neurotransmitter systems that are also involved in schizophrenia, like the muscarinic receptor system. And now uh, I turn to the final topic that I can cover in this talk in relation to molecular imaging of schizophrenia with this somewhat ironic uh, poster dating back to the 1920s when there was a, a, or 30s when there was a very active politically motivated campaign in the United States for, towards the prohibition of cannabis, which only became illegal about 100 years ago, I forget when exactly. And so there was a portrayal of it as being an exotic and dangerous uh, menacing thing uh, that would lead to moral corruption and so on. I mean, that's, that's what people thought, including the notorious, uh, uh, I would have to say propaganda film, Reefer Madness, which uh, depicted uh, cannabis as being a gateway to madness or psychosis. And um, drug crazed abandon. And that was, remains a kind of a controversial topic. I think that everyone agrees that this was a propaganda film and yet, um, there is some association with, you know, that's been shown very, in various studies in Sweden and elsewhere that cannabis use, especially heavy cannabis use among young adolescents seems to dis distinctly impart a risk for a uh, first, uh, first uh, uh, manifestation of, of schizophrenia. Does that mean that it causes schizophrenia? That's a distinction that remains to be resolved. And we're sort of doing the experiment in my home country of Canada where cannabis has recently become um, legal and in fact uh, openly marketed uh, a little bit too much. Everywhere you go, there are these cannabis shops here serving potheads, cannabis users since uh, I forget, um, which is humorous because the part of the phenomenology of cannabis intoxication is that people <laughs> can't remember anything. So. Um, we're doing a social experiment. Uh, so far, there, as far as I know, there has been no big increase in the incidence of uh, schizophrenia in Canada among young cannabis users, but we'll find out. Nonetheless, having put that topic aside, the cannabis cannabinoid receptor, especially the type one cannabinoid receptor in the brain, which is the site of action of THC, the constituent of cannabis, um, is a another important target for research in schizophrenia, and one that's also relatively um, poorly developed, um, with only uh, a smattering, a half a dozen or so studies so far compared to the hundreds of the dopamine system. Now, this recent paper in JAMA Psychiatry from this um, a combination of uh, Finland and uh, uh, London, which are two of the leaders um, in molecular imaging and schizophrenia, you will recognize the name um, Oliver Howes and probably should remember Yarmo Hitela from, uh, from Turku, who is uh, doing great work on this. And they, for the first time, just a few years ago, did a, a PET study in patients with first episode psychosis using a, uh, a cannabinoid receptor ligand. Now, I don't expect you to uh, you know, follow the chemistry, but I just want to convey an idea that Making tracers for PET is, uh, is not an easy matter. You have to use some pretty advanced chemistry. You need a cyclotron to make the f fluorine 18, and you need special chemistry to integrate it into, uh, uh, into synthetic molecules to be used for proceeding from a precursor molecule here that is non-radioactive to the actual product, which has this chemical name. We prefer to call it uh, FM PEP because it's much easier to pronounce. And it contains the fluorine 18 and has the chemical structure that makes it bind to cannabinol, uh, cannab uh, the CBD1, uh, the <laughs> cannabinoid one type one receptor that's present in brain and is thought to be the main site of action of cannabis and related uh, products. So um, summarizing their results in, uh, I think it was 10 or 15, um, Control subjects, we see that the, this cannab, uh, cannab, cannabinoid type one receptor is very abundant throughout the cortex, maybe especially in the cingulate cortex, the limbic cortex. It's also present in 
the uh, basal ganglia, the striatum, uh, the anterior cingulate cortex, and maybe uh, a little bit in the insula here. Um, so it has an interesting distribution, but the remarkable thing that here we see the average of 10 subjects or so who were healthy controls showing the uh, distribution of the um, ligand binding to cannabinoid one receptors. And here in the lower part of the figure, we see a similar group of patients, none of whom were cannabis users. So there's no interaction here. This is the state of being um, uh, untreated and with a diagnosis of schizophrenia and having a very significant reduction in the abundance of cannabinoid receptors. So roughly speaking, too much dopamine, not enough cannabinoid receptors. We don't have scans in the same individuals with both uh, uh, ligands, but that would be something very important to do in the future. For example, it's possible that maybe there are multiple classes of schizophrenia, some with high dopamine, some with low FDG uptake, some with uh, abnormal cannabinoid receptors. And we just don't yet know how to categorize them. Uh, they went further, um, like uh, uh, Van Amersfoort, they compared the results with cognitive scores. Well, first with the PAN score, and they showed the more severely affected individuals within their population, it looks like 15 uh, cases, um, the more reduced the binding was. So in the hippocampus. So here's a, a, a pretty compelling uh, correlation. The converse correlation was found with cognitive performance using a uh, sort of a temporal lobe hippocampal task or, or well, no, excuse me, an executive function task, uh, digital symbol coding. And the um, um, more severely affected with the subjects with the um, less intact cognitive performance also were the same people who had low uh, binding in not in the hippocampus, but in the, in the interior cingulate, which fits with the executive function role. So they were able to tease out associations between how severely the cannabinoid system was affected with particular manifestations in positive symptoms and in a negative symptom uh, of cognition. And, and that, I guess, is a, a, a new thing because previously we had markers that were either for positive symptoms or negative symptoms. And here we have a marker that seems to uh, relate with positive symptoms in one region and negative symptoms in the other region. So it might be that cannabinoid receptors will prove to be the unifying factor. So I conclude my talk, uh, which is a very brief survey of a huge literature um, to show that uh, PET and stacked imaging studies have implicated, among other things, dopamine receptors, muscarinic receptors, and endogenous cannabinoid systems in the pathogenesis of schizophrenia. However, no single marker is pathognomonic, my favorite word, but one I still can't pronounce, for schizophrenia, um, because all of them show extensive overlap such that um, in a population there is an abnormality, but within individuals, they may fall within the normal or the abnormal range. So it's not diagnostic. So I conclude by suggesting that brain imaging, molecular brain imaging captures only specific elements of a multi-dimensional space that might be represented by dopamine, glutamate, the glutamate still, um, uh, muscarinic receptors, um, endogenous cannabinoid um, ligands, at least, and we don't know how, how large that list is, but it's, it, it may take de decades of continuing research with different uh, tracers to kind of crystallize this into a, a, a correct and complete model that may uh, establish what I would call a molecular typology of schizophrenia, which I think will prove to be not one, I'm sure we all agree that it's probably many overlapping syndromes, some of which may be dopamine driven, some of which may be more driven by other factors. So I think this is the task for molecular imaging for the next couple of decades. And that brings me to the end of my talk and I thank you for your attention. Uh, dear Professor Paul Cumming, uh, thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. And it seems to me that we are really, really moving to the whole course on neuroimaging in psychiatry. So it's your second lecture on molecular imaging in schizophrenia. And we would be happy also to know about uh, MRI, uh, fMRI studies in uh, schizophrenia.
and perhaps we can move also to the topic of neuroimaging in depression and um, uh, to work out the module on uh, neuroimaging in neuropsychiatric uh, disorders uh, which you might lead uh, within this uh, web library course. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Happy to. Um, and I would add bipolar disorder, which I think is not talked about enough in this literature. Uh, absolutely, and bipolar disorder, and we can talk on uh, neurological conditions as well, and uh, as far as we can extend, uh, and uh, you will be, I hope, available for uh, this um, uh, lectures recording uh, for us. Thank you very much for this uh, collaboration. Thank you very much for this impressive uh, lecture, thought-provoking, and you really inspire us to uh, move into this uh, topic and uh, uh, thinking about research, uh, uh, which might be organized by our center in the future. Uh, so thank you very much once again, dear Professor Paul Kami. So and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye bye.